before we get going, I'd like to quickly introduce both Steve and Ian. Stephen Courtright is the Henry B. Tippy Research Professor of Management and the Director of Executive Education in the Tippy College of Business. He directs the Tippy Leadership Collaborative, the college's home for custom executive education programs. Steve conducts research on leadership and employee engagement with a focus on manager burnout. Ian Crawford is an Associate Professor of Management and Entrepreneurship and a Henry B. Tippy Research Fellow in the Tippy College of Business. He conducts research on employee engagement, team effectiveness, stress, and burnout. He has consulted with numerous organizations about their employee engagement and team effectiveness. Thank you both for being here today and sharing your expertise with us. Step one, unmute yourself. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we are really glad to have you here. Thanks for joining us for Another episode of Tippy's Men in Blazers. I'm uh, pleased to be joined by my colleague Steve Courtright today. Yes, we are wearing the same thing, and yes, that was pre-planned. Um, if you missed our last episode, you can go back to the Tippy webinar series YouTube page where uh, myself and my colleague Daniel Newton talked about re-engaging at work in a post-COVID world. Um, as a side note, our moniker of Men in Blazers is not original. It is a straight ripoff from uh, these guys who are the actual and more famous men in blazers who discuss football and wear blazers usually at the same time. Uh, the difference today is that tippy men in blazers discuss management and wear blazers uh, usually at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to keep rolling with that joke until we are sued for trademark infringement. Um, we are going to talk today about what is quiet quitting. Um, should we be alarmed about this and uh, what can be done? And I'm particularly pleased to be joined by Steve today for two reasons. Number one, if you remember Daniel Newton, he is about five inches taller than me. So to align our eye lines, last time I had to stand on a box for the full hour of the webinar, and today I don't have to do that. We're just vertically aligned already. Uh, the second reason is Steve, frankly, is the best quiet quitter that I know. He can quietly quit better than anyone um, so Steve, tell us, what can we learn from all your experience quietly quitting? And I promise I won't tell our department head. I won't tell the dean. Well, I was going to say the purpose of the webinar today is not for me to have any kind of confessional about quiet quitting past or present. Ian may choose to do that, but I will not choose to do that on my part. Um, but it is, as Ian said, our purpose today to talk more about what is quiet quitting and whether we should be alarmed about it, what can be done about it. And I think that the best way to start talking about this particular subject is to actually give us a bit of a historical perspective behind it. And so I want to just turn your attention to about uh, close to two years ago now, our good friend and colleague at University College of London, Anthony Klotz, wrote a really groundbreaking article in about March of 2021. And he coined a, an equally catchy phrase to quiet quitting called the great resignation. And essentially what, what, what uh, Anthony did was he took the turnover research and what predicts turnover, and then he was also looking at current trends that were happening, and he essentially in March 20, 2021 predicted massive increase in quit rates, and it did not take long, only a couple of months for us to start seeing that. And by fall 2021, this was the topic among all business circles. This is what was keeping CEOs and executives up at night. And we learned that in our work in the Tippy Leadership Collaborative. We've learned that in classes that we teach as we work with organizations. This was the issue keeping people up at night. And so as a result, actually, I'll turn your attention to another webinar series. This wasn't a Men in Blazers webinar series. This was a men in, a man in sweater <laughs> one. He hadn't been inducted yet. <laughs> That's right, exactly. Thank you, Ian, for inducting me. Um, and we did this in November of 2021. And essentially, the purpose of this was to make sense of the great resignation. And again, to answer some of the same questions. What is this? Is this something alarming? What should What can be done about it? And in that webinar, I talked about the great resignation as being sort of analogous to the derecho that happened during 2020 here in Iowa in the Midwest and sort of this perfect storm. And we talked about how this perfect storm of turnover had occurred because of various economic forces and social forces combining to influence psychological forces and again causing these record levels of turnover. So again, this is the stuff that we're talking about in November of 21. And so 
Again, to put quiet quitting in perspective, we want to talk about this, but let's also just go back to Great Resignation and say, are we done with this? Is quiet quitting the new fad now? Is it a fad? Well, let's start talking about re Great Resignation a little bit and see where we're at with it first, because that'll help us to understand a little bit more about quiet quitting and where we're at with that too. So what I have for you on the on this graph here is just an illustration of the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics data around what quit rates look like. And again, you can see the huge spike starting in about early, you know, spring, second quarter 2021 and significantly increasing. Now, you can also see on that graph that starting in about the, you know, so somewhere in about 2022, right about the beginning, you start seeing it slowly, slowly declining to the point where we are not at pre-pandemic levels by any means, but we do have somewhat of a downward trend going on when it comes to, to, to turnover. So as we talk about quiet quitting, we might ask the question like, are we done with great resignation then? Again, is this kind of the new fad? Um, well, not really, because what we see again from quit rates is that we see again the, the the you know the rates sort of hanging on as what they will, and we do see some cooling off, but this is still an issue. And now, just in time for this to still be an issue, we've got quiet quitting that makes its way into our vernacular now. How did it make its way in here? Well, the first thing we should say is that quiet quitting is making its way everywhere. This is a common term. When we do work, for example, we get questions all the time. Should we ever be worried about this? Is this quiet quitting? Hence kind of the genesis of this webinar. It's all over the news. How did we get here exactly? It's actually really interesting that in contrast with Great Resignation, where it was actually an academic who wrote about this and predicted this, this is a social media phenomenon, believe it or not. And it started on TikTok. <laughs> So the first mention that we have of quiet quitting came from a career coach who's on YouTube and on TikTok. His name is Brian Creeley, popular career coach who posted about quiet quitting based on a Business Insider article. And that, that particular video alone got about 100,000 likes on it, had about 4,000 comments. And then not too much longer after that, another TikToker, ZK Chillin, <laughs> gave a 17 second video on quiet quitting and talked about quiet quitting was sort of the pushback against hustle corporate culture. Now that video sent this term viral, 4 million likes, or excuse me, 4 million views, 500,000 likes. And since then the hashtag quiet quitting has received over 2 billion social media impressions. And that, by the way, was back in November. We could have seen since then an increase in social media impressions. Yeah, so uh, there is a range of opinion on what quiet quitting actually means. Um, it doesn't mean quitting your job, of course. We already have record levels of actual quitting. Still happening. <laughs> so on top of that, um, on one range of the spectrum, people understand it to be just pure laziness, um, where you're just loafing or wasting time at work. Um, if you remember Peter Gibbons in the classic Office Space movie, he comes in to tell the consultants about his work day and his work effort, where he comes in 15 minutes late, he sneaks in the side door so no one will see him. He just spaces out at his desk for like an hour. And then he's like, you know, I would guess that in a work week, I do only about 15 real minutes of actual work. <laughs> On the other hand, People on the other range, on the other end of the range, people define quiet quitting more as just setting boundaries. So you're still doing your core job duties, but increasingly saying no to the idea of saying yes to everything. And so you recognize that you have a life outside of work and that your worth is defined by more than just what you produce. Um, Josh Bittinger, he's a market research consultant for a management consulting company, and recently in the Wall Street Journal, he said, you know, people who stumble on the phrase quiet quitting, they assume it encourages people to be lazy, when actually it reminds them to not work to the point of burnout. And he describes his years of saying yes to everything in his company, trying to stand out, and instead he's learned now to say no more, he reserves evenings for himself, and he is avoiding checking email on vacation. You know, he says that I get my job done. My projects are completed. I'm performing well at work. I get good feedback. And I still have time to just step away from everything. 
Um, note that while quiet quitting has been popularized in the US, it was probably actually predated globally more by um, in China. The term in 2021 of Tang Ping, which translates literally to lying flat. Um, the idea behind this is it's a physical protest against the culture of overwork, where instead you should become more content with attainable achievements and uh, allow yourself time to unwind. Um, also interesting is this data that came from a uh, YouGov survey in August of 2022. They asked almost a thousand adults their opinion on what do you think about quiet quitting? And it's just fascinating to see the generational differences here where the younger the uh, respondent trends, the less favorably they view the idea of always go above and beyond. You should do the work um, and more positively to just doing the work you're paid to do, no more and no less. Um, interestingly, our friend and uh, Wharton Business School professor, Adam Grant, he commented on this chart that uh, one of the greatest mistakes we make is imposing our suffering on the next generation. Just because you endured unreasonable demands or unclear expectations at work doesn't mean that others should. And he argues that the responsibility of leaders isn't to repeat the mistakes of the past, but rather to improve the future. So should we be alarmed about quiet quitting? Well, there's some evidence, for example, these Google search trends that suggest that the quiet quitting trend is already over, that as early as October of 2022, interest in this had flattened out. And so um, perhaps this issue has already resolved itself. You know, signs of recession and layoffs are occurring. So people in fear of losing their jobs are back to the grind. And um, it may be that we're back to a normal. And it's probably that normal that we ought to be alarmed about. So let's talk about that normal just a little bit and see if there's something we should be alarmed about here. And I guess sort of the way to think about this is we think about quiet quitting as, is this something new or is this sort of an age old problem with a new label attached to it? Is it for all intents and purposes, kind of old wine and new bottles, if you will. And so there's some interesting data around that. And the way that Ian has talked about, uh, about that range of quiet quitting and really defining it is actually very, very similar to the way that organizations, including research organizations like Gallup, measure engagement and really track engagement. So I want to just show you some interesting statistics around what Gallup in particular has collected around employee engagement. In this case, this is actually North America, although they do this work all over the world, really. But I want you to just notice the trends in employee engagement, that's the top line, and then in disengagement, which is the bottom line there. And Gallup has been collecting this data for over two decades now. And you'll notice that there's various ebbs and flows when it comes to employee engagement. For example, look at 2000, dot com bust. <laughs> we notice that there's less engagement and there's more active disengagement. But then we start leveling out, then we get great recession, and that sort of increases some of the active disengagement, and then it kind of levels out again, we see it drop in 2018, the active disengagement, and then starting in 2020, again, that bottom line, we see it start climbing a little bit more that active disengagement. We also see engagement start declining a little bit after 2020. So is quiet quitting something that's brand new? I guess what we could suggest from the data is not really. This is actually a pretty consistent problem. It's a problem of, of, of trying to figure out how do we help engage workers and how do we help people prevent feeling burned out? And so on that regard, let me show you some other Gallup data around burnout that really I think gets to the heart of this issue when it comes to quiet quitting. An alarming 76% of employees report experiencing burnout on the job at least sometimes. It's three out of four people that we work with. Now of those, there's over a quarter of those that experience burnout very often or always. So again, more than one in four people that we work with are constantly almost experiencing these kinds of levels of burnout. And I don't show this data on the screen, but just to couple it with this, has this risen in the last few years? The American Psychological Association likewise does various surveys on employee burnout and well being. And what they have found is that since 2019, burnout symptoms have increased 38%. 
We also have other data that suggests that this rise in burnout is particularly pronounced among the managerial workforce that we have, and in particular among remote managers, managing remote teams. And so again, we get to this question of what is quiet quitting? Is it something to be alarmed about? And the answer that we would kind of give you is yes, but it's not anything new. This is an age old problem that we have around helping to engage employees and helping to prevent burnout. The question that we would also like to answer then is, is it, is it even worth those efforts to try to decrease that burnout? Is this something that organizations really should be focusing on? Yeah, you know, you talk about what's alarming. I mean, it's alarming that so few people come to work feeling actively engaged. And it's alarming that so many are experiencing burnout. And it's alarming that that's the way work has felt for a very long time. And just to give you some imagery about this. So prior to the pandemic, the World Economic Forum estimated, this is back in 2016, but the annual costs in terms of turnover and lower productivity because of burnout worldwide was about $322 billion every year. And it's just hard to grasp how much that is. But if you were to go into the bank and you had enough in the account that you could withdraw $322 billion in crisp $100 bills and you stacked those up, that stack would go from sea level on the earth 205 miles high up to the orbit of the International Space Station. That is $322 billion every year. And surely the cost is higher now, given all that we've been through. Uh, the visual image that I retain with me for this actually comes from uh, Yellowstone National Park. When I was a boy, my parents took us there for the first time. And it was shortly after the 1998 fires that consumed more than 36% of the total acreage of the park. And I, I remember it exactly in my mind, just like this, the way that um, ecologist Monica Turner described blackened tree trunks, creating a stark and seemingly desolate landscape. Um, in, ecology, in ecology, an event like this is called a disturbance. Um, it alters the state and trajectory of an ecosystem, um, particularly when it is very large it's severe and infrequent, and it can alter the dynamics of that ecosystem long into the future. Um, I see the disturbance of the pandemic as being similar, creating similar challenges and uh, dynamics in our human ecosystem. Obviously, it was large. Obviously, it was severe. And hope to high heaven that it is infrequent, um, but the aggregate loss of health, of life, of livelihoods has been both um, unknowable and tragic. And similar to this stark and seemingly desolate landscape of burned tree trunks after the Yellowstone fire, um, I think we are witnessing a stark and seemingly desolate landscape of burned out individuals following the pandemic. So with that kind of stark picture in mind of how we can see what burnout is doing for our organizations, for our overall well-being and society, let's start digging a little bit more into burnout. Because again, we're talking about quiet quitting as really being reflective of burnout. So what exactly is burnout? We want to answer a couple of fundamental questions about this that get us to better overall manage burnout and also improve engagement. So a couple of questions, let's talk about these. And, and when we talk about burnout, we're gonna talk about two things. We'll talk about the primary symptoms of burnout and then what's happening underneath the surface. Now, technically our titles are doctor. Our children tell us that we're not real doctors, but we do kind of treat this subject as if we were real doctors. We see a symptom on the surface and underneath there's something that's going on there. And so what can we see on the surface that would be indic indicative of someone, yourself or someone else, that is suffering from job burnout. So in the research on this topic and research that has been going on for about 50 years or so, since the early 70s, we've been doing research on burnout, there's three major symptoms that really come out in this research that individuals experience when they're suffering from burnout. 
The first one and really the driving symptom is this feeling of emotional exhaustion. And that's really analogous to physical exhaustion. I have my once a year time where I try to relive glory days on the, uh, on the football field and I play and I play Turkey bowl and then I can't move for a week and just getting up to do very simple things like eating can be, can, can, can be rather onerous. Um, and it's like that emotionally as well, that we kind of get to this point where we just feel like we do not have the emotional capacity to continue moving forward. We can even experience physical symptoms that really are kind of reflective of anxiety that make it so that we physically can't even feel like we're going in, but it's really due to the emotions. It's that feeling of just utter dread that we might feel as we go into work. That's usually the first and primary symptom of burnout. But as we continue experiencing that, we also start experiencing some level of cynicism. Cynicism about the people we work with, cynicism about the work we do, cynicism about the people that we serve in our professions. We overall start getting a little bit more cynical. And then together, emotional exhaustion and cynicism just lead to this overall loss of professional efficacy. And what I mean by that is that feeling that if you put forth effort in your job, you're going to either get the work done and or you're going to make a difference in that work. And so these three together, when we feel that emotional exhaustion, I can't do this anymore, you feel cynical. And when we feel that loss of professional efficacy, we can know that those are the primary symptoms of burnout. And what we're experiencing is really actually unique from stress. And I'm just going to jump in. I think about these as three kinds of loss. You lose your energy, you lose your belief in others, and you lose your belief in yourself. Super well said. And, and so these are, again, the primary symptoms of this. So if you spotted this in yourself, if you spotted this in coworkers, if you spotted this in, 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 in employees, this is what's happening with burnout. This is, this is what's happening at the surface. But what's going on underneath the surface? Again, we're not real doctors as our children would call us, right? But what we wanna do is nevertheless, as organizational behavior researchers, is we want to treat not just the symptoms, but we want to treat the underlying cause. And so what's happening underneath the surface that's leading to these symptoms? And do that, I just want to very, show you a very simple kind of boxes and arrows flow chart of what's happening underneath the surface when we're, when we're suffering from burnout. Anytime that we face any kind of stress or we face something as severe as burnout, it's always precipitated by some kind of a demand in our environment. And, and, and Ian will talk a little bit more about what those demands mean, but those can range from anything like a new challenge or a new opportunity to hassles in the workplace. And it's and, and the demands can create some emotions in us. Sometimes those demands create energy. Sometimes they create the opposite, which would be kind of more anger and anxiety. And the emotional response that we have to those demands then drive the behavior response we have. So on one hand, we might face a lot of demands, but those energize us. And so therefore, we're going to engage with those demands. They're exciting. On the other hand, we may face demands and they're going to bring about that anger and anxiety. And then the best way to put our behavior response is we kind of engage in this fight, flight, or freeze response. We fight against the organization or against our people. We may engage in aggressive behaviors, hostile behaviors. We may engage in more flight behavior, great resignation. This is where some of that comes in, in terms of just leaving the situation or freezing as well which means just sort of staying put, not doing, not really kind of you know, freezing in the status quo, doing as little as possible, basically. And so actually put in the context of this model, by the way, we really look at quiet quitting as very much a fight and a freeze response to burnout. It's the notion of I'm doing this to kind of fight against the hustle culture, if you will, as some people might call it, or, or sort of show that I'm not going to be part of this, you know, overwork or whatever it might be, or a freeze response where we just do the absolute bare minimum just to get by. So that can happen, that process, but here's the hinge factor here. The hinge factor is actually that, that circle that we have there, which is the psychological resources. And what research shows is that we can actually handle a lot of demands on our plates if we feel like we have the psychological resources that we need to address those demands. Psychological resources can include things like overall efficacy or confidence. They can include feelings of support. They can include feelings of having some level of control, like we're not just at the mercy of others. And we can actually handle a lot of demands if we've got the resources to, to be able to handle those. The issue then what happens with burnout is that the demands chronically exceed the psychological resources necessary to cope with those demands. So when demands exceed resources, that's when we get into the anger and anxiety, the fight, flight, freeze response. 
That's what's happening underneath the surface when it comes to burnout. Yeah, let me talk about how this played out in a recent study we did with a group of architects. Um, we actually had the chance to work with the Iowa chapter of the American Institute of Architects, and we surveyed them. And it's a good, good context because it's a notoriously stressful profession with very demanding clients, a lot of work order changes and things like that. And we surveyed them over a three-month period, and then we tracked their career progression for the next two and a half years. And just here's some interesting things we learned. First, I'm going to hide the resources circle for just one second. Yeah. And as Steve was alluding to, not all demands are the same. Like every workplace has demands that generally divide into two major categories. First are these challenges, which are seen more like opportunities to grow and progress, where you get a new job assignment or more responsibility, or you have a really complex task to work on, where there's something you can learn, grow and master, and perhaps be rewarded for it. In contrast, every workplace has hindrances. These are like the obstacles that thwart your progress in career development. Things like role conflicts or office politics or red tape or broken, malfunctioning or missing equipment or having really unclear tasks or ambiguous job demands. And people respond differently to these two types of demands. In the surveys of the architects, we found their perception when they had more experience with challenges in their firms was they felt like, hey, my firm is going out of their way to provide more support for me in my career development. But when they experienced more hindrances, they had the opposite reaction. This is just a lack of support for me in my development. And what was the resulting response? Well, predictably, when you feel supported at your firm, you want to be there, you want to engage. And when you feel less of that, predictably, you would leave the firm. We actually followed the LinkedIn profiles of every one of these architects for two and a half years and found the ones in our surveys who said there are more obstacles than opportunities in this firm, they were more likely to leave and have a new firm later. Now let's bring back a psychological resource that was an interesting twist in this study, which was we also asked in the surveys the employees to rate their proactive tendencies as a person, a, a personal tendency that's a psychological resource to initiate your energy and effort and overcome obstacles. And um, predictably, the more proactive architects um, would perceive challenges as even more so opportunities and supportive. And it would really strengthen these relationships. They would respond even better to a new opportunity or a challenge to grow in their firms. And you would think, and what we thought or predicted was that these same proactive employees, because they can overcome any obstacle at all odds, they would deal even better with the hindrances and they would overcome those and stay with the firm as well. And what we found was the exact opposite. The more proactive employees actually had more negative reactions to those hindrances. They would perceive even less support than their peers and they were even faster to leave the firm. They would use their proactivity to escape the hindrances in their firm rather than staying around trying to fight them in futile ways. They were the first to go. So a, a bottom line here to recognize is that your most proactive employees will be first to flee an environment that is full of obstacles and hindrances. And so much of that can just be attributed to that burnout factor, right? That we well, just, yeah. We, we just get burned out when we're a high performer, we're trying to do what's really good for the firm or for the organization. And then we constantly meet obstacles yeah. uh, that don't lead to goal fulfillment. It's just a recipe okay. for feeling less support and more burnout. And the first thing yeah. I would do as a manager that takes no time, well, it takes time, but not um, I, I would go to every one of my employees and ask them one question. What are the obstacles that are getting in your way and how can I help remove them? Yeah. And maybe you can, and maybe you can't. And there's other advice for what you would do depending on their answer, but I would at least be asking the question, what obstacles are getting in your way? How can I help remove them? And let me just then interject with a study of my own then too, because it really builds off nicely on this. That kind of conversation, what it can do is it can build employees' confidence and their ability to actually get the work done. Confidence that the manager is going to be there for support, confidence that they'll be able to help remove some of those barriers toward goal, toward, toward goal accomplishment. It really makes a big difference. And it reminds me of a study that I did back in 2014, actually. And the inspiration for it, although we didn't conduct it at Walmart, Walmart was actually the inspiration for it. So, <laughs> Once upon a time, I had a friend who was a manager at a Walmart here in the United States, and it was for all, I don't know the quite the right corporate term for it, but it was a regular size Walmart, and that regular size Walmart was transforming into a super Walmart. And so we were actually having dinner at this friend's house, 
And I asked the friend, how's it going? That just seems like that it would add a lot more work to you and to managers. It seems like a huge expansion of everything from product lines to getting new staff. You know, essentially what I asked was, how's it going? And he says, you know, these interesting new challenges, right? This opportunity to grow and this opportunity to be able to do something new that we haven't done before. For some managers, he says, I had just never seen them more engaged before. And as a result, they're far more, they're far better leaders. They're, they're being better at casting a vision for their group, for the organization. They're better at connecting with their employees. And so for some, they're just on fire. That's how he described it was on fire. He said, but I've got this other group of managers that have had the completely different reaction. Same exact challenges, just a totally different reaction. The way he described it was, it was kind of burning out and bottoming out. In our study, we captured that as just sort of this leadership vacuum, that the, the sort of this flight response or this freeze response too, that leaders just kind of abdicate their responsibilities. They become more of an absentee leader. And so it was fascinating to me to see the same challenges could elicit to two totally different responses, emotionally and behaviorally. And what was the key? This goes back to what you talked about earlier about those kinds of conversations. It actually all hinged on how efficacious that leader felt to be able to accomplish their goals. If leaders felt like they had the support, they felt like they had the confidence then to be from, from leaders and themselves to be able to accomplish those tasks, that's what put them on the engagement path. On the other hand, when they lacked that efficacy, that sent them on the burnout path, and then it just created this big leadership vacuum. So I think hopefully altogether, you can see from this how burnout happens, not just in terms of how to spot it, that's the symptoms, but also how it happens. In the end, it's about making sure that we have demands exceed, uh, not exceeding our resources and that we manage those demands to eliminate as many obstacles and hindrances as we can. And we increase those resources to be able to help managers and employees cope with the demands. So two options then to manage burnout. You can decrease demands in the way that the Ian study described, or you can increase resources in the way that my study described as well. Yeah. So that's how burnout happens. And hopefully this gives you an idea of what's going on when we talk about quiet quitting. Again, we're really talking about burnout. So then the major question becomes, what do we do about it? We understand it better. What do we do about it? Well, I can tell you what we're not going to do about it. Um, here's that's always a good common place reaction. <laughs> yeah, I have a friend who, you know, it's like, well, what we're not going to do is. <laughs> so um, first thing, what we're not going to do. One of the most common things that's happened, especially in reaction to quiet quitting, but predated that because of all of the remote work mm -hmm. during the pandemic and the flexibility, um, managers have uh, increased what's been called by some paranoia that their workers aren't doing anything. Mm -hmm. And so they've increased surveillance, like alarmingly so. Prior to the pandemic, about one third of companies had some type of employee surveillance system in place everything from computer um, monitoring software to key loggers, whatever. And since then, another third has adopted these employee surveillance systems, bringing the total of small, or excuse me, medium to large U.S. companies that use some kind of surveillance systems, a two out of three. Um, hardly anything has been adopted that fast. Even the iPhone no. did not have, correct. smartphones didn't become adopted that quickly. Um, and the problem is, there is little evidence that these systems work at all. In fact, they probably backfire. Uh, number one, they tend to erode employee morale because they feel they're no longer trusted. Second, it leads to what's called productivity theater, where people just do things to look busy, even though they're not accomplishing anything. So they'll join meetings unnecessarily that they don't need to be in. Um, or even worse, uh, employees have started adopting extremely creative hacks to trick the systems and keep their bosses off their tails. Um, Wall Street Journal had a hilarious article about one employee who took the cord for his mouse, wrapped it around his oscillating fan so it would keep moving and keep the computer from going to sleep. And then he went to the gym. That is what we call <laughs> active disengagement. <laughs> So you're saying surveillance can increase disengagement then. <laughs> but apparently the fact that they don't work hasn't stopped companies yep. from adopting them. So uh, hopefully yours hasn't. Um, what about job expansion? If uh, one definition of quiet quitting is simply doing what is in your job description, then make sure everything that used to be extra mile is just added to the job description. Well, what's the problem with this? 
what generally tends to happen is the company lays off these three people who are helping work function um, well, and then they take the core job responsibilities they had, add it to the one person's job. So now you have a person who is doing the job that three people ought to be doing. And the only way to do it is for that work to spill over normal work hours and eat into weekends and nights and pay time off if you ever take it. And then it's completely unsustainable. This compounds the problem rather than solves it. What about offer more perks, right? Keep the workload really high, but just offer more rewards for doing it. You know, it's a terrible place to work, but there are some great benefits for doing it. And um, again, referencing Adam Grant, he uh, said before that perks and vacations, those aren't solutions to burnout. At best, they're band-aids to temporarily stop the bleeding. The main solution to burnout is to reduce the demands. What about the simple idea? Just ask people what they want and then give it to them. Like that seems like the logical conclusion, right? And it's temptingly simple. But the problem with this, as argued by uh, business professors Mark Mortensen and Amy uh, Edmondson, is that this is a trap because it tends to focus you on the material aspects of a job that are forefront in an employee's mind at the moment. Um, it also is easy for competitors to imitate. So whatever you do, they can. And it also actually has the uh, least enduring impact on employee retention. But luckily what Mark Mortensen and Amy Edmondson provide is a fantastic framework and advice um, in their recently published Harvard Business Review article from this month, January, 2023, is the encouragement for a company to address burnout and engagement holistically by rethinking what is your employee value proposition. We've actually been studying how to engage employees and how to reduce burnout as scholars, not myself and Steve explicitly, but as a field for over 30 years. And this knowledge isn't new, it's just not commonly practiced. Um, so they describe this value proposition as an interrelated system of four factors. Obviously, there are the material offerings. These are the financial rewards for doing work. Also includes your conditions for working, your schedules, your flexibility, office space, location, equipment, and so forth. Second is growth and development. These are all the ways that organizations help employees increase their skills and become more valuable in the marketplace. Then there's connection and community. These are the benefits that come from being a part of a larger group. Um, it includes just simple things like being appreciated and valued for who you are. It's a sense of mutual accountability and it's having satisfying social relationships at work. And then last of all is the meaning and purpose. Um, these are the aspirational reasons for why the organization exists in the first place. It's why you do what you do. It's the answer to the core question of why do I get up and go to work each day? And for most people, that's generally because I want to make some kind of positive difference in the life of others, to make an impact somehow in the world. And it's really important to recognize that these are tightly interconnected parts of a whole system but they're also experienced and addressed differently. So notice that on the left side, material offerings and connection and community, those tend to be experienced in the short term. It might take a long time to build a community, mm -hmm. but people's experience of that community is relatively day-to-day -day in the short term. Whereas growth and development and understanding meaning and purpose, that's something that's gained and experienced more over the long term. And then how you address these different factors ranges from individually where material offerings have to do with what each individual earns as a part of the work they do and the growth and development that that individual employee needs. Whereas connection community, that can only be built collectively and meaning and purpose has to be understood collectively. And why that's important to know 
is that this helps leaders overcome biases towards prioritizing the present over the future and prioritizing one need over others. And Steve's going to talk about some problems that can occur yeah. when that happens. I say one thing that's really important that Ian mentioned about this is to really look at these as a system, because we can look at these individually and say, okay, we can offer vacations and perks. That's the key to getting people engaged and prevent burnout or give them opportunities for growth and development or give them communication and connection and community or give them meaning and purpose. And a lot of times we look at this as or rather than and. And actually, one of the things that we find in research is that an undue focus on only one of those actually can have some downsides. I'll just give you an example of one of those quadrants there, which is meaning and purpose. You would think, great, have a purpose. Purpose right? trumps everything. I've heard that many, many times. I've probably said that a time or two myself in my early days, right? Purpose trumps everything. But here's the issue with purpose. Purpose is important. It's part of that system. But if we only focus on purpose to engage people, there can happen things, for example, like pay exploitation. So we'll purposely pay you below market because, well, you're 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 part of a really important organization. Cause. You're part of a cause. And we may not give you market salary. We may even make you at the poverty level, but we're part of a cause. And that has its own kind of societal as well as individual implications. But more than that, it's just a recipe for losing employees who can go to other causes for better for better material offerings. Another example of this, and maybe just much more even sinister than that, is that there's really interesting research done by some colleagues of ours in our field that look at how people actually use meaning and purpose sometimes to justify unethical behavior. That might be everything from fraud to anything else. We do it in the name of the company. It's for the benefit of the company. And so again, that's not saying that meaning and purpose isn't important, but it's part of the entire system. And so what we really like about this framework is it not only is something that you can implement, but it's also something that you can think about as a system as a whole, and that each one of these quadrants speak to the value proposition that we offer our employees, which in turn influences their engagement and their propensity to stay. Exactly. So what can you do? Like we've talked about this framework, how do you actually use it? So simple steps, three takeaways you can um, walk away from today with. The first would be assess what your situation is. So you need an understanding in your company and as an individual of both the supply and demand side of the equation. This is the resources mm -hmm. and demands. That's what you're assessing here. So uh, collect information on what your organization is currently offering employees and what do they need. And as an individual, assess yeah, this as well. And you can do this with just traditional, plain old interviews and survey methods. Mm -hmm. And if you're like, well, where can I get a survey for this? Go to integrated EVP. That's integrated employee value proposition.org. Uh, Mark Mortensen and Amy Edmondson, fellow colleagues in the field, they created this free survey tool to give you ideas of how you could go about starting to assess all four of these interrelated factors. Um, so start there. Yeah. And then after we start, after we start with just assessing the, 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 you know, what's happening and again, using that tool, that's really, really a helpful tool. Then we start embedding it into the language and the conversations that we have in the organization. One of the things, for example, as we figure out what is our value proposition, and as we really kind of assess that and collect data on it, is that it informs every other bit of communication that we have within our company. So for example, we may have certain material offerings, but what's the why behind that? Why do we have those? Why are those important to the overall value proposition? What makes that unique from what other competitors may be able to be offering? We can also talk about the why in terms of meaning and purpose. One thing we've really learned from research is that people definitely subscribe more to the why of an organization than just the what, the policy, the procedures, the actual work itself. And so we can embed the value proposition into our overall organization meaning and purpose. So we really just start talking about the why behind our value proposition and really think about why do we have material offerings? Why do we have certain opportunities for growth and development? Why, why is our meaning and purpose important? Why is our connection and community unique and valuable? And an interesting application that I think is top of mind for a lot of uh, managers is where people work, remote versus in-person, calling people back to the office. And what's important here is you're not just talking about what you expect employees to do but why? why is it that way why do we have people doing what they're That's doing exactly right exactly people want to know the why behind it 
And then after that, one of the things we oftentimes get uh, gets, uh, you know, I, I, I guess kind of uh, a trend that we might fall into if we're not careful is being afraid of repetition. Yeah, we've said it once. Nobody wants to hear it again. That's sort of our, you know, a little bit of our uh, of our uh, assumption behind it. One thing we've discovered as educators is you can't repeat enough. <laughs> By the time someone's heard it 12 times, they've heard it for the, they've understood it for the first time. And even marketing research shows that when it comes to sales and really the change in the conversation, it is a bit of a sales pitch about your employee value proposition. It requires multiple, multiple touch points for someone to even start thinking about how that product might influence them or whether they would buy that product. So structured repetition. And this can take place, for example, in some of our talent management strategies. We can talk about that in a recruitment and our onboarding processes. We can embed that into our performance management system, for example, to get employees talking about how their work contributes to the meaning and purpose or how they fit in that connection and community. We can embed that into our talent management strategies overall to really create structure around that repetition. And then finally, recognize, whoops, wrong direction, <laughs> the need to update, right? Your operating environment's going to change, what employees need changes. We've gone through uh, ups and downs and we can expect more will happen. And so um, reassessing is a necessity and just the same assessment process from step one it's probably a good idea for most companies to reassess at least annually. Um, if your company, however, is going through major upheaval or big changes or mergers, then you might need to do more frequent assessment. Steve, give us a high level summary of what we talked yeah, about. Yeah, we talked about a lot today. We started with talking about quiet quitting in its context. It, we talked about the historical development of it. Why has it become such a viral term? But what we really settled on was thinking about quiet quitting, not so much as a brand new thing that's happening, but an age old problem around how do we engage our employees and how do we prevent burnout of employees? And so we've talked about how can we spot burnout employees, what happens when employees are burned out. And we provided this from this new and what we think is a very integrative framework for thinking about how we can engage employees by selling, if you will, the unique value proposition that our organization has for its employees. In the end, quiet quitting really is about managing burnout, and it's about helping to increase engagement. And that pays dividends over and over again for any company and for the individuals in it. And just to show that how big of an issue this is, you may be aware of the U.S. Surgeon General's recent report on well-being. In the introductory letter, said there is a reckoning among workers who don't feel that sacrificing their health, family, and communities for work is an acceptable trade-off any longer. To conclude, I want to return to Yellowstone National Park. Um, I've been back there three times since my childhood, each time about a decade apart. And uh, sorry, am I getting emotional? I got to pull it together, Ian. <laughs> Um, over that period, I have uh, witnessed something miraculous, the regeneration of a forest that was thought to be gone. Um, at first, it was this little green carpet of seedlings about four years afterward, and then a growing forest of young pine trees. And today, it is an incredibly lush forest of lodgepole pines as far as the eye can see. Um, in ecology, this is known as succession. It's how a community naturally replaces an old one. And it's particularly dramatic after particularly large disturbances. Um, one aspect of those Yellowstone fires that I find most fascinating is how the succession even happened. So uh, it has to do with the lodgepole pine cones. They are serotonous cones, which have a resin that seals them and they will never release their seeds unless that resin melts at a temperature requiring at least 113 degrees Fahrenheit or 45 degrees Celsius. And that, ha that adaptation helps ensure that the pine cones don't release their seeds unless the forest has been cleared, such that there's conditions as such as an open canopy to allow more sunlight to come in for those seeds to germinate and new seedlings to grow. As far as the succession following the pandemic and the pervasive burnout we've seen. I am currently thinking about it in a way similar to the regeneration of the forests in Yellowstone. 
And I maintain hope that over the coming years and decades, that perhaps we too will witness something miraculous. Perhaps we've now had a sufficient disruption of our entrenched ways. Perhaps we are now seeding our human ecosystem with new and healthier ways of working. Perhaps we have finally cleared enough debris and opened up our canopies to more sunlight so we can have newer and healthier ways of working grow. I've started to see this in our society in search of recovery. We are more willing to talk about burnout, about mental health, about sustainability, about our well-being. We're more willing to have appropriate and caring conversations. We're more willing, instead of just saying, you know, how are you doing and moving on, to ask people, how are you really doing? And then being quiet and listening. I think people are realizing that we can do less with less rather than always trying to do more. People are starting to learn how we can solve problems by subtraction rather than always adding more, by reducing the complexity and focusing more tightly on the things that we can do most effectively. Very well said. And we thank you for joining in with this. This is an issue that I'm sure is keeping you up at night. And we hope that this has been helpful for you in thinking about not only how to approach this issue, but the hope that can come as we continue to approach this issue. We hope from an evidence-based perspective we provided here. So thank you once again for joining Men in Blazers part two here today. <laughs> we appreciate it. Uh, Ian, that, thank you so much. I'm grateful that my camera is off because I am wiping away a, a tear. I think that message uh, really resonates with a lot of us. So thank you. Um, we do have a lot of questions in the chat, and I just also want to give you a quick shout out. Um, not a question, sending appreciation to the Tippy team for your work to bring this to the masses. I am a part of the choir and appreciate your research and advocacy, and I will be sharing this recording with my network when it's ready. Awesome. So just wanted to share that with you, but let's dive into a few Wonderful. questions while we have about five minutes. Um, so the first question is, are employers caught in a crossfire? On the one hand, they have dealt with the great resignation in recent years. Now they appear to be facing a new crisis, quiet quitting. Can you juxtapose the two phenomenons and explain what possible actions employers can take in the midst of these? So I know we've talked yeah, a little yeah. bit about that, but I liked that. Yeah. You know, that compared yeah, this, to that. And I know yeah. we only have five minutes. So. I'll be quick. This is so hard. This is probably the essential tension that is agonizing for every manager today, which is to make work more sustainable, I need more people, but I can't get people because they've already resigned and I don't have anyone else to hire. And so the, the simple phrase I keep repeating in my mind is, well, then the only solution is to decide how do we do less with less? And it's forced prioritization. And, and it's not true prioritization until you have to decide about some seemingly important things that you just for now will not and cannot do. And those are very hard conversations to have, but you see that in different ways. Mm -hmm. Like my favorite restaurant downtown, they are open four days a week for dinner only because they simply can't staff seven days a week for lunch yeah. and dinner. Like it's a forced choice that's very difficult that hopefully they'll be able to update and revise. But yeah, I hear you with that tension. Absolutely. And the other thing to recognize too, is when we think about great resignation juxtaposed with, with uh, quiet quitting is, you know, with great resignation, there's a lot of economic forces at play. There's a lot of social forces at play there, but the research is actually pretty clear on this, that one of the leading causes of turnover that gets people to look in that market is just simply burnout. And so as you, as, as we talk about burnout, what we're really talking about is we're, we're not only trying to resolve the quiet quitting issue, and some of that comes with doing less with less, right? But we're also helping to do what we can outside of just market forces outside of our control to help uh, with the great resignation too. So there are companion topics in every in every way. There's also some research that suggests that what people are quitting is more of a toxic culture than a lack of pay or benefits or things mm -hmm. like that. So um, changing a culture is more about changing the conversation yes. rather than changing whole systems of compensation. So that's, that's something right. also to think about. I, I, a recent definition of culture that I heard that I liked by John Amici, former NBA player and now organizational psychologist is your culture is defined by the worst behavior that's tolerated. Mm -hmm. So if you need somewhere to start, figure out what that is 
and 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 improve that culture and community or yeah like we talked about earlier yep um i think we are gonna have time for about two more so i i like this one have you found yet at this point in the research that quiet quitting has a generational element but is it more common around gen z as opposed to millennials or gen x have yes, you found will... in the research where boomers play into this yeah steve's flying back to the slide we showed earlier um that yes, there, here's your generational difference in beliefs about quiet quitting. Um, 65 and older crowd believes on the whole, employees should always go above and beyond, whereas the 18 to 29 crowd, only 50%. And then you see the reverse when they ask the question about being paid for the work you do, no more, no less. So yeah, there's definitely a definitely. generational difference here. And the argument being that just because your generation suffered something doesn't mean you should impose it on the next. Yep. Right? A leader makes the future better rather than just repeating the past. Yeah. That's great. Um, here's another good one. My company feels like they are attempting to quote unquote force the connection part of the employee value proposition, mostly by surveilling in office attendance. To what degree can leadership actually cause that value versus simply offering it if someone wants it? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, this this kind of the forced interaction is uh, definitely one thing that I think we can learn from research that doesn't really work. We actually even force interaction that's meant to help people get to know diverse groups of people. Research has shown that doesn't really work. And so um, there's definitely some dangers behind behind doing that. But I think at the same time, this goes back to this framework here. It's not always just giving employees what they want either. It's about being able to really assess what helps us to be able to have a unique value proposition for our employees and what really builds into our strategy. And so the best organizations that I've seen handle this is to look at job by job, to look at um, the group by group, and to really assess uh, rather than a kind of on a broad scale, but again, kind of looking at uh, at um, much of this uh, uh, this graph here, the material offerings, looking at that at a very individual level. Um, is one way to really kind of look at that particular question. So I'm not in favor, I would say, from a research standpoint of sort of the forced interaction, but nor am I just saying we should only just address employee needs and that's it. It's really about creating that value proposition. Yeah, and I might add that I would say there is value in structured interaction um, where you have a purpose for bringing people together. Yeah. Often it's for collaborating on a project. Most networking is not exchanging business cards or cocktails it's actually working on something meaningful together. So there's one way to mm -hmm. build community by co-working on something important. Um, and there's other ideas for how, instead of usual icebreakers, there's some great social psychology research from the 1970s about specific types of questions that people who don't know each other well can discuss in a 45 mm -hmm. minute period to understand things about each other that build a social closeness that wouldn't be there otherwise. So there's importance on structured and thoughtful interaction. This relates to something that I oftentimes teach about. When do we have a meeting? When do we have like an, a meeting in general, but especially like an in-person meeting? And the research on this suggests exactly what you said. The structure is, are we learning something? Are we deciding something? Are we bonding around something? Yeah. Those justify that sort of structure there. Yeah. And so again, that kind of goes with, uh, with, the, with the framework that we presented earlier too. Yeah. Hopefully that's helpful. Well, we are at time um and steve i did notice that you had the tlc slide yes, up so i, I just want wanted to oops i took it off the slide though i just want to just tell you that i know we didn't have as much time to answer questions we could do this all day ian and i have fun doing this stuff truly um but if you are looking for a similar experience like this where you can have experts come in talk about this topic and talk about it with your organization and as ian said open up those conversations that's what the Tippy Leadership Collaborative is here for, to help design the right experience, whether it's a custom ed executive education program or an expert speaker to come. So please learn more about us visiting our website or reaching out to me or to our program coordinator, Alice. And we'd love to be able to assist you in this and build on, build on what we've talked about today. Yes, and we did have a lot of questions and comments in the chat or in the Q&A. Oh, my gosh, I just did it to myself in the Q&A that we didn't get to quite yet. But um, you do see that Steve's um, contact information is up on our website. And of course, you are more than welcome to reach out to Ian if you have any questions that we didn't get to today. Um, on behalf of both Steve and Ian, thank you to everyone for attending the Tippy webinar series presentation. Quiet quitting. Is it real and what to do about it? When our event ends in just a moment, you'll see a quick survey. We'd be grateful if you could share your thoughts and help us make future virtual programs even better. 
On behalf of the Tippy College of Business, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. And as always, go Hawks.